whether they have any impairment. You can certainly give them, you know, the covert kinds of moral tests. Uh, so you would need to have an expert who could help to identify um, a valid, culturally appropriate, reliable test in your community for um, an offender uh, in that age range. <coughs> Um, and see whether that is helpful. Otherwise, you're compelled to generalize from the larger body of studies at large uh, that address that topic. Uh, there might be other suggestions. Yes, if you uh, have a comment to your response, go ahead. Yes, I'm wondering to what extent is the balancing out of long-term and the short-term implication of the action that you engage in uh, could be said to determine your maturity or immaturity, right? To an extent where, as she was referring a while back to Neva at least, uh, there were others also who were involved in the same crime, and after the commission of the crime, they were crying, and I mean, in the sense that they regretted what they did, right? But I don't think that if if they had been mature or not mature should affect the determination of their crime. Uh, to an extent that even if they had overlooked the long term implication of what they were doing, they will still be held responsible for the act in itself, right? So, so, yeah. so, so you're looking at their subsequent emotional responses or remorse as an indicator of that disjuncture between uh, the long term and the short term effects. So that, so that if you were asked the question about how do you go about uh, presenting information that somebody might have engaged in criminal conduct and even understood that it was wrong at the time, but should still be uh, brought within this doctrine of Dola and Capax? Uh, you would say that's one way that you can use that individual's own uh, behavior subsequently to address what insight they had at the time. Yeah, yeah so, you yeah, know, because if this is a rational that we are going to use. Even adults may overlook the long-term implication and only focus on short-term implication. So I don't think that that should be a criteria for you to be able to determine whether the act that done was the result of maturity or immaturity. Ah, I see. So, you, so you're arguing that, that we should not use that? Yeah, commission of a crime basically is going to focus on short-term effect, right? Because people think in long-term, they are going to get away with the crime. <laughs> okay. Um, do others agree? I mean, it, the, you know, this was clearly a, a very significant case. Um, you know, as as you know, everyone heard about this case everywhere um, in the world, and so um, there's been a lot of thought about those events um, and a lot of debate about it. But, but out of those, we are trying to elicit some sort of good principles for advancing uh, or changing these doctrines. Yes. No, I, I was just wondering if, if this maturity is influenced by labeling or the treatment given to children themselves. Meaning if, if by calling children immature, we are actually making them more immature. So, um, for example, is there a difference between older siblings and young, younger siblings? Older siblings may be charged with taking care of their younger siblings more, therefore might attain maturity faster. So, does that happen? Um, we'll, we'll look at a labeling issue uh, in a moment and, and think about your question about the influence of labels there. Um, you know, but, I, but I do think that <coughs> one other dimension uh, that we should think about in terms of um, uh, the discussion we were having earlier about penalties and so on is how this might play in to eligibility for the death penalty uh, since that applies in your community. In communities where the death penalty can accompany severe criminal conduct, if the offender is under the age of adulthood, um, how does your legal system address that concern, particularly when the offender is right in that cusp period where based on certain criteria an individual can be processed in the legal system 
as an adult uh, or processed uh, in the legal system as a juvenile, would that be that that person may or may not be eligible for a death penalty depending on that distinction? So, uh, under the Juvenile Justice Act, uh, if you were tried as an adult, uh, you would death penalty is prescribed for the offense. Because you were a juvenile at the time of the offense, you, you cannot be given the death penalty. So if you're below 18, you cannot be given the death penalty. Uh, I think it's similar in the US, uh, where there was a US Supreme Court case, uh, I think Goldberg versus Simmons, where the Supreme Court uh, declared unconstitutional the death penalty for juveniles if you're below 18. And that's because in that state they had the option in very serious cases to decide that a juvenile could be tried as an adult. So what happened in that case was an individual was then you know, tried as an adult. <coughs> it was a heinous crime, sentenced to death um, or to life imprisonment or death penalty. In that case, it was a state where the death penalty applied. Um, and uh, it was on appeal that that uh, ruling uh, occurred saying it was unconstitutional. And there were very uh, evocative facts there because it, no one seemed to have documented as clearly when that decision was made that in fact this individual you know, was not only uh, a juvenile at the time of the of offense, but in fact had severe intellectual uh, disabilities and had a mental age far, far younger uh, than his chronological age. And, all that was considered when this individual was processed as an adult was the chronological age. You know, so sometimes, sometimes in response to these issues of maturity, etc., you do need to have expertise on really uh, the gap between chronological age and functional age uh, in terms of what the dimension uh, of interest might be. But yes, thank you. So that brings me to the next question: is uh, if there is something called a functional age, then how are we defining children in the first place? Why, why do we put 18, etc., especially when we don't let them drink, or don't let them drive, or don't let them work, but we can incarcerate them for, for years? Uh, so um, what, is there a psychological sort of definition apart from age that defines children? Um. Well, there, there are other dimensions. Uh, you know, I guess age is a common denominator uh, and it's a benchmark uh, at a grosser level. And what we really are exploring here is some of the circumstances where exceptions to that need to be made uh, based on sufficient evidence um, more than anything else. But I think, you know, I think that's a great provocative question as to whether age is just too crude and too simplistic a demarcator. Should we have a more individualized assessment in every case about whether this person is actually a child? I guess I guess the way the law is structured now is that there are you know there is the option for a more individualized assessment. Um, you know, but it shifts the burden and the presumption shift depending on uh, where you are when you make such an assessment. Um, Yes, you know, those are, those are uh, great sort of policy-oriented questions uh, to consider. Um, and, and I think, you know, comparing the way the different systems deal with this is, is helpful in showing up uh, some, of, uh, some of the weaknesses of different policy determinations that are made. You know, so, so what do you think led to the fact that in, in India you have a cutoff of age 7 versus age 10? all kinds of things it leads to, you know, the bar being drawn there arbitrarily at age seven versus age 10 in other communities. Quite often, you know, there are one or two extreme cases, you know, there are responses to some, you know, heinous crime committed by a very young child and then the age gets cut down or changed, um, you know, in response to just a one aberrant individual when in fact the policy might otherwise be quite so. So, so you know, it's helpful to see what leads to that. Before I leave um, the R versus JA case, I mean, I just want to <coughs> um, highlight what the circumstances were here so that you can see how this played out. Because this was a younger 
um, boy, age 11. And, and I, you know, and I think some of, some of the facts uh, in this case circumstance are quite helpful uh, to consider uh, some of these gaps that we've been talking about between understanding and behavior. So, so this was a, cu a couple of young kids, age 11 and 12, and two 11-year-old boys who invited a 12-year-old girl uh, to go and play in the park. And uh, she lived in that neighborhood and said yes. And so she spent some time riding on, you know, one of the swings in Australia that looks like a koala. So it's a koala swing or ride that bounces a bit. Um, and the boys were ch chatting amongst themselves about, you know, and how they belong to a gang, and the gang had killed some family members, and now they had to follow the gang rules. And you know, she overheard this, um, and then the boys wanted her to go over the fence from the park into a golf course uh, and down into some other secluded area. She refused, but then she was told that if she didn't comply, they would bash her, or one of them would bash her. And so uh, she felt threatened, and so she went over the fence. Uh, and then when they got down to the more secluded area, the 11-year-old boy uh, produced a cheese knife uh, that he'd taken from his home. And then uh, he threatened her and said that he was demanding to have sex with her and it would hurt her uh, if she tried to leave the situation. And so she was terrified uh, and complied. Uh, and uh, removed her pants, uh, and then you know he climbed on top of her uh, and attempted to have intercourse with her. But the facts were very confusing, and nobody could confirm uh, that intercourse had occurred uh, until afterwards, when she reported the situation to her parents. Uh, when she got home, she was taken for a medical examination, and it was conclusively determined that in fact, you know, no intercourse had occurred, but it had been attempted. Um, and so, if you look at the penalties associated with this, they were quite severe for an 11 year old. Um, intent to inflict bodily harm or intent uh, to engage in non consensual intercourse, uh, as this was, you know, it has a 12 year penalty. And then, even if you didn't find any of the intent, just indecency, such as occurring, has a five year penalty. So, what happened next was the prosecutors or the police wanted to uh, talk to the boy um, to find out what his moral understanding was of the criminal conduct in which he had engaged. Uh, but, um, you know, as you know, you're not required to speak to the police. You don't uh, have to uh, participate in an interview. Uh, if your right against self-incrimination is paramount, the police have to respect that. And the boy's mother advised him not to speak to so they had no interview to go on. So the questions about this case, uh, the flow are exactly the kinds of things that we've been talking about a bit here. You know, so if the child's issue here is what do they know about the criminality of the offense, uh, how can the prosecutors start to establish it if they can't even talk to the child to try to make a retrospective determination? Uh, in this case, uh, if you looked at uh, those facts at all, what was going on in J.A.'s family in his personal history? Did, did any of you look at any of those facts? We, we know what happened in the park and the golf course, but what was the background, you know, aside from uh, the stories they were telling about gangs? Were there any facts that you think about J.A. had a bearing on uh, the extent to which the prosecutor could or could make this determination about Doha and Quebec. Yes, in his family situation, were there any facts that you would regard as maybe more sympathetic? In other words, weighing in uh, towards lack of responsibility on his behalf, or facts that you think um, you know, if we you know, can, can consider the discussion we've had about long-term and short-term consequences or his understanding, any facts that you think bear on those determinations? Yes. Sorry, can let you start with the microphone and try to yeah, uh, Probably the fact that his mother asked him not to say anything. Could that be 
an indication of the fact that they don't want to own up to something that they may have actually done. In the family, it's a value that he, he realizes that you don't take responsibility or you don't need to take responsibility for what you've done. He's been taught that at some subconscious level. So. Possibly, but you know, that's a legal right that I think most of us would uh, regard as a very important legal right. And I think there are other facts in this case to draw on. We don't need to go there. So what else had, what else was in the background? In the family, there is exposure to domestic violence and uh, to, uh, extreme anti-social behavior by the father, and drug abuse by the father, which is also rising from father having bipolar disorder. Uh, and then his, his own history of past um, fighting, etc. in school, and sort of emotional disturbances in school, um, so that was considered to be Right, and, 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 how, and how should those kinds of things weigh is uh, the question for you to consider. So, so once the judge started digging into the background, you know, um, you certainly learned that this child probably is in quite a vulnerable state at age 11. Um, you know, it hasn't got uh, the greatest uh, family stabilities uh, in order to promote pro-social behavior. There were a number of things that the court concluded made the child uh, more vulnerable, both in terms of his own personal history, um, as well as uh, what was going on at home. And um, and though, you know, and so those factors were considered. What what did the court say about? Um, um, the distinction between understanding the criminal conduct or has that weighed in on the issue of criminal responsibility? Sort of crime 
and we're running away because we don't want to reform. I think that was the other distinction which was sharply drawn. Yeah, yeah. So, so not an inference of pure criminal responsibility and guilt. This is uh, probably not not pertaining specifically to the case and the fact patterns of the case that we're talking about. But to add to uh, what my what uh, Professor Dhanda has been saying, that between the age of seven and fourteen, the transition from concrete operation to formal operation is 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 actually riddled and replete with a lot of imitation. So what we uh, tend to see um, in cases such as this is that there is a there is a complete. Um, annihilation of the possibility of what the child is doing is just an imitation of something that he has seen. And when we are calling it as imitation, it's again, it's again a term that de development psychologists have come up with. For children, it is quote unquote play. So the play that they do, I mean, when, when I'm talking about it, it's coming more from the education point of view. But then if you start looking at the connections between what the child does as play, and its consequences in the adult world, which Professor Nanda has been, uh, you know, telling, uh, the difference is stark. The, the, the implications are huge. The consequences are absolutely uh, very high. I, I think so that's, the, the that's point, very helpful um, in, in light of this discussion to, to make that distinction as well about the role of imitation and role play versus, uh, you know, actually a deliberate, you know, uh, and what we also find in education is that this idea of play and imitating what adults do in, in, in their own small <laughs> congregation tends to go till the age of 18. So um, how the professor delivers a lecture in the class, a small tutorial group with just two, three people, one of them doing it for the others is something that we have observed. So I was just wondering whether this overlooking of the fact that what the child is doing is not having a criminal intent, but an imitation of what he has seen in a movie or he has seen people do. This takes us back to how the environment is at the home and a whole lot of other variables which are which in reality cannot be replicated in the home. Sure, and that, you know, and I, I think. Um, <laughs> The, the issue you had to focus on was, was whether the test is really apt, you know, and I think we've highlighted from a number of standpoints now, maybe the test has some shortcomings uh, on its own, in its bold terms, uh, that we're inferring many things in order to make it a more useful test. So uh, that's uh, a very helpful discussion. All right, so we're going to uh, wrap up a bit. Um, <coughs> by uh, coming back to uh, this labeling theory issue that we've discussed in a few other classes and see how that works in a juvenile context uh, and particularly talk about also another strand of our discussion about traditional versus non-traditional kinds of legal procedures as ways to deal with the, the many layered issues uh, surrounding uh, litigation and how they play out in this instance in juvenile cases. So the essence of labeling theory is that if you attach certain labels to individuals, whether it's uh, in the context of insanity uh, in criminal cases, or uh, in this case, really notions of uh, you know, perhaps delinquency or criminality attached to children, um, <coughs> when that causes people to internalize that they are criminals. Uh, and think of themselves in terms of those many ways with all of our multiple identities and roles that we've discussed. If you start to think of yourself then at a tender age as primarily criminal, uh, then that might have a very negative effect on your ability uh, to allow those other facets of your identity socially to develop uh, equally uh, and might then lead to uh, more recidivism or more continued juvenile uh, offending. So that's the fundamental theory that some uh, researchers have tried to test. And, and the notion that they had is that the more contact you have with the criminal justice system uh, might lead you to internalize that you are therefore a 
an offender and a criminal uh, than if you're kept away from the criminal justice system. So part of the whole principle of diversion uh, definitely has a relationship to some of the psychological theories on labeling. So keeping people out of uh, detention centers, keeping them out of the criminal justice system uh, can be accomplished uh, instead by using alternatives such as informal youth justice conferences uh, where totally different procedures uh, arise. And these are even separate from what I was talking about in relation to drug courts uh, and those other alternatives which are a form of court. Conferences are not at all. You know, so, so the prediction is that the more stigmatized you feel by the contact with the justice system, the more you will be inclined to recidivate. So recidivation is often the outcome variable or dependent measure in psychological terms that you're looking for uh, to test the impact of these theories. Um, the alternative approaches focus much more on things such as that good lives model, uh, the notion that you need to strengthen the positives, reintegrate people into the community, uh, and conferencing is unique in this way because it includes members of your community, not just members um, of uh, you know, the court system or the justice system who are attendees at a conference. Uh, and uh, in our kind of conferencing systems for juveniles, we tend to have two models in my state, uh, depending on who the convener of the conference is. So we have some youth justice conferences that are convened by members of the police force, they're called police convened conferences, and we have other youth justice conferences that are convened you know, by a juvenile justice with community members as the primary conveners. And particularly if they're indigenous youth, they might be convened by community elders um, or by um, a community center um, that works with juvenile justice, a community center run by indigenous community members. So there's a very different personality um, or uh, atmosphere that might militate depending on whether you're at a police convened or at a community convened kind of youth justice conference. Um, so, so that just is a historical variable uh, that we have these two different kinds in our state and, and both are um, and, and over the years, I think some of those differences have become less pronounced than they maybe once were. Um, when formal comparisons have been done of just recidivation rates, you know, which are arguably quite a difficult uh, and a dependent measure, you know, because you have to wait a long time to see if people reoffend, you have to have engagement at a formal level with the criminal justice system to get those measures of further reoffending, um, and there might be other offending that has occurred that you never measure or never know about. So. So, you know, it is a fairly, what I would say as a social scientist, a blunt instrument compared to some other instruments for really testing the efficacy or effectiveness of conferencing models. But when those have been done, uh, they have showed uh, reductions in reoffense in New South Wales, for example, in studies of 15 to 20 percent reduction. So they're not removing it, but they appear to be reducing it. There are also differences the formal evaluation based on the type of crime. So certain crimes uh, seem to have better responses in terms of recidivation um, than others. You know, so violent offending in particular. But uh, drink driving uh, was not affected. So the recidivation rates for drink driving offenses by young people were just as high before or after either traditional court processes versus uh, the conference. So something about that crime, uh, you know, was outside of uh, the legal process being driven by other factors. And when, and, and, and in fact they increased, uh, I don't know uh, by how much, but they went up. Um, the ones where there were absolutely no differences were property and shoplifting crimes. So, so the intervention seems most significant for violent types of offending. And this uh, slide over here just gives you um, a little bit more detail about youth justice conferencing in my state um, in just in terms of the proportion and number 
and you'll see that actually the completion rates are, are quite high. So what we what we've got here is uh, within a 12-month period an indication that there were um, 1,000, you know, 400 and something conferences, but they include more than one offense in many instances. So they actually covered twice as many offenses. So you could guess that a lot of the offenders were charged with at least two kinds of offenses per conference. When we looked at the extent to which uh, the police were, uh, you know, present at conveners who had initiated this, that was slightly uh, less than half. So, so that might be initiated by, initiated by community conferencing uh, for the others. Um, out of the 1,400 or so um, that were uh, run, only about you know, 1,200 actually went to conference, so some are dropping out uh, for various reasons. And 85% and were fully facilitated. Um, the young people did always attend. Um, you know, but the but the ratio between 10 and 50 that actually had young people participating uh, and facilitated wasn't uh, that different. Um, you know, so so the primary attendees, if the offender's not going, uh, is usually the victim and the community members because conferencing includes uh, the victim uh, as well as the offender. So when we see a statistic like that, what I'm understanding is yes, the victims were there. And for one reason or another, the offender, no, but generally they were both there. Um, the um, percentage of victims who fronted up was much less than the percentage of offenders. You know, so it's not a mandatory uh, burden on victims if they don't wish to attend a conference uh, to attend. Uh, but you know, you can see that close to sixty percent are attending. Uh, when they've been the victims of the crime. So, uh, but there's still value in the conferencing proceeding with the elders present or with community members or police present, uh, even when uh, the victim isn't there. And then um, what we have at the end of this, uh, this bottom half of the slide is some idea about the outcome. So in the course of a conference, um, there's usually a discussion about the kind of harm that ensued as a result of the criminal conduct. Uh, so the victim has a voice, uh, or representatives of the victim, if the victim is absent, to focus on what those harms might be, whether they're against persons or property or the community or that social group at large. Um, and then uh, the idea is that a kind of contract or an outcome plan will be prepared using a sort of a template uh, and uh, the goal is to see whether all of the parties will agree on an outcome plan that is appropriate uh, and that might, might be quite divergent from the normal legal penalties. Uh, and so you can see that there was a high ratio of outcome plans that were agreed once the conference was facilitated, very high, 99%. And when there was no outcome plan that was agreed, Sometimes it was because the court rejected it. So the parties would have a conference and send the plan off to the court to see if the court was in agreement. And only in a very small number of cases did the court reject it. We don't have the reasons here. And sometimes uh, there was no outcome plan because the victim and the offender uh, just had no consensus. You know, so um, it, the, again, those reasons aren't uh, elaborated, but it's those together only add up to 1% of the cases. And then the criterion in our system is that once the plan is agreed, it has to be fulfilled, fully implemented within a six month period. And if that falls apart, then I think things get referred back to the traditional criminal justice system. So it's an interim phase. Uh, to resolve issues informally with a lot of input not only from the victim but the community and the offender uh, to see whether some implementation plan uh, can be established that is effectuated within a fairly short space of time. And so out of the total group, 87% actually were implemented in the time frame. So there's a bit of follow-up, usually by uh, the convener and others in the community to ensure that uh, the young offender has complied. Um, and, um, and, and 
you know, so that, that gives you some idea about the mechanics of it um, and, and workability of it. Um, the success rate, I guess, depends uh, ultimately in the system uh, on the support of quite a lot of things. So it would require, you know, that there's support from the judiciary, support from the community, uh, support from the police, um, and support from the juvenile justice um, uh, policy makers themselves. Um, you know, and I, and I think what has happened in our community is that with those rates that I showed you on the last slide of, you know, mixed results for different crimes, that people have been very disheartened. <laughs> uh, and they feel as if the recidivation rates are such that perhaps it's not a successful program. <laughs> Uh, and there's a little less commitment since those statistics were produced in 2015. In 2016 and on, I think that I would say there's been, uh, you know, some dropping off of support in our community. So I'm very interested in hearing, uh, you know, about any sort of similar program in your community for diversion uh, outside of court, so rather than just diversion from the adult system. I was just wondering how uh, this is drawing from the whole restorative justice, uh, you know, paradigm of looking at the criminal justice system. And uh, because I have a feeling that possibly the RJ efforts go a little beyond this and kind of have, you know, addressed the whole issue of uh, individual hurt and that psychology more frontally. Uh, than just, uh, you know, like seeing the victim as center to the entire discourse and hence uh, making people feel that whatever um, they've lost by someone else, uh, you know, uh, assaulting into either their privacy or their sense of what you expect from others, that gets addressed more squarely. And possibly also the, the business of repentance and apology and you know all of that trajectory is looked at more closely. And that was one uh, parallel which I had in mind and the other was like kind of effort which people did around truth and reconciliation. You know like uh, because this I mean, the conferring idea and the, ha the fact of your having these conversations seems to um, seems to be sort of saying that you know you cannot make it like an objective or distant kind of an activity it is something you just it's an individual you've done something wrong and somebody else has been wronged and possibly when you get people to confront that uh, wrongness and you know sort of to, to acknowledge that you have done it may have a better way of your uh, possibly moving away from that kind of wrongful conduct and yet not leave so many people into pieces on the way. I, I just wanted, I mean, I'm making this kind of a triangular connection and um, sort of like more wondering from there. What we have basically is because of the diversion system, it's like some level of work that people are doing with the delinquents. Not a community kind of exercise. It's more like uh, preparing individuals who have done wrong uh, towards a certain body of capacity building. And, and it's, it's more a non-governmental exercise. Some level of organizations were involved in that process. But to the best of my knowledge, it's more uh, an interaction with the wrongdoer, not so much as also taking on board the people who are victims of that wrongful. I, I, I would say that a lot of the youth justice conferencing models um, uh, fit with restorative justice, um, although it's not always clear exactly what model uh, is being applied once they're implemented, you know, statutorily? Um, that might only be apparent really uh, on the ground, but I think that broadly, restorative justice is the most common. And so, all of, all of those attributes that you've highlighted about 
what's involved in restorative justice uh, would uh, traditionally be present there. So you can include things such as you know apology uh, and things that and aspects of an agreement that might not at all be available formally under the rule because of because of more of a focus on uh, making amends uh, to the victim uh, in those circumstances. So, so, I, so I'd say that's been a strong driver of our particular model uh, and seems uh, to be effective. And in terms of getting the offender to take more responsibility, um, it does seem as if that's a, a very effective psychological um, trigger to produce more resistance. And, and I think that same trend was very clear in the program that we discussed a few days ago about the diversion at the pretrial stage of the child sex offenders who had to take responsibility for their conduct as part of the therapeutic program that they underwent. And is really the defining feature of that particular program. And so, so there seems to be uh, some, you know, an important notion uh, out of uh, that practice uh, that is characteristic of these types of conferences that is quite absent uh, from uh, many formal traditional legal proceedings where if you look at the kinds of behaviors that are stimulated in offenders, it's that they should not talk, um, you know, and exercise their right to silence, uh, deny any offending as the best possible defense, uh, and move as far away as possible from accepting responsibility in order to produce a, a good defense. So I, you know, I, I think it's very interesting that the legal system on the one hand gives people that message which becomes associated uh, with uh, the litigation mode and on the other hand has all of these contrary kinds of models where the message to offenders is so vastly different. We're going to be trying to get them to own up, take responsibility, engage in dialogue not only with the community but also uh, with the victim. Um, uh, and, and I guess, uh, you know, if, if you're committed to one or the other, um, you need to think about how does this all fit into uh, the greater picture when people are going to be uh, released into the community after um, a traditional kind of sentence or um, integrated back into the community during these community kinds of uh, interventions that are so different. Uh, and, and what that does at the end of the day in terms of any burden on the rest of society to continue to deal with these offenders if the integration does not happen uh, before incarceration. Those are, those are some of the great consequences. What's that just Yeah, I not just in the criminal justice system. I was wondering whether you know, disciplinary bodies and regulatory setups and other places where possibly you've not committed crime but you've done a range of wrongful conduct, whether that could be a first level trial, you know, a first level where you possibly start. Because you could have, I mean, I'm talking about as an educational institution, the way we look at wrongful conduct and the manner in which you do disciplining where you possibly would suspend, you would sort of, you know, expel, you would do a range of other kinds of things where you would turn the person away from the institution and to say that, all right, this is not the kind of an individual we want. And I think there is a connection between how you do disciplining to the sort of people that would turn up at, you know, uh, these sort of sites. And I don't think that's a connection that is often made. It's like uh, education institutions feel that the sort of work that they are doing is is there, you know, like they're just keeping their own space clean. And uh, penal institutions then talk in terms of the absence of education as a causative factor. You know, sort of, it's a it's one of the silences that you know you find uh, which evidently have an ideological effect, but it's not something that we usually talk and discuss. Because you talk about human conferences and you know that void. So 
it, it was, it's something I have been like knowing quite a lot about so as to uh, can we sort of purely disconnect disciplining from uh, whatever penal reform you want to bring. I, I mean, I, I think um, out of some of the research on conflict resolution processes, if we don't think about it just in terms of ADR, anything, but just conflict resolution, even separate from the law, um, the, the general uh, effectiveness measure seems to be that the earlier there is uh, this kind of informal intervention, uh, the more likely you are to, you know, to ameliorate the issue. Uh, so that you don't end up polarizing people uh, in the way that often ensues once more formal uh, proceedings are instigated, whether they're within an administrative context or not, uh, or towards litigation, because because uh, because that is a very divisive uh, kind of intent. Whereas the idea of getting a group of people to sit around a table, you know, uh, and the usual model in conflict resolution, you know, is trying to have more of an oval table or a round table so that you don't polarize people even by the furniture um, and, and get a more uh, engaged discussion where people will be equal contributors, um, modeled by the furniture, so that you have a better chance of uh, resolving things in, in a more humane fashion. So, you know, I, I would say that if you just look at what goes on in conflict resolution theory, that would be very supportive of that kind of notion. Um, you know, and it does require you know, attention to things as soon as they bubble up, rather than waiting for them to become repeated or, or long-standing behaviors. If you have the ability to do these uh, very much more gentle interventions earlier on, they tend to be preventive, uh, as well as uh, people are more responsive. Quite a number of aspects of conflict resolution theory that I think are helpful for the audience. I did want to jump back to the labeling issue because I realized that I didn't really highlight um, on, on this slide that when measures were taken of the stigmatism, uh, you know, by specifically using a scale uh, that measured the degree to which someone felt stigmatized by the court process. Even though other things might not have predicted recidivism, those internalized feelings predicted recidivism. You know, so so it was a it was an important feature that I that I've got to emphasize that just what the individual experiences, separate and apart from the context, is important. Um, and so uh, some people might be more or less sensitive depending on their exposure to the legal system and how they interpret it, and so forth. But uh, you can be vulnerable uh, in that way too. I think we're right at the end of my discussion points. Uh, you know, to you know, to wrap this up, I think some of the things that we've talked about in just in our last discussion about harshness of different kinds of internal uh, administrative systems and parenting. Uh, raise quite a lot of questions about negative versus positive reinforcement in a multitude of contexts towards people and how how they respond. You know, and I and I think uh, in some cultures there's been quite a dramatic shift away from things like corporal punishment and corporal uh, discipline in families as well as in schools as well as uh, in broader legal communities, although there are still some communities where you can get lashings uh, for criminal violations and other kinds of physical penalties, you know, including uh, the death penalty for us to think about. Uh, but in general, there has been uh, a shift away from that and, so, you know, sometimes there's quite a generational gap and it may take a while for other cultural values uh, to overtake things and get the legal system to up, but that's you know been I think well uh, driven home in many communities and families, and um, you know I've certainly seen that in my own family, where after one of my uh, nieces uh, you know had young children and their grandfather was disciplining them by whacking them, 
Uh, there was a family crisis over whether this was appropriate or inappropriate behavior. You know, the arguments are made on, you know, this is what we always did. It didn't hurt our children. <laughs> this is what I had the rights to do as a grandfather in trying to uh, install discipline in my young grandchildren, you know, and the next generation saying, no, this is not appropriate. You're not allowed to do this in my house. I don't want my child treated like that. I don't believe that this kind of discipline is going to be helpful. And you know, if we look at all of the research that I've summarized, you'll see that those underpinnings of that shift are corroborated by the evidence space uh, that we have been uh, looking at. Other quite interesting things to consider. Uh, as we prepare for our final discussion on Thursday, again in this arena, are cultural differences. Um, and, I, and there was a small section in our chapter just on the role of cultural differences towards uh, criminal responsibility and severity of crimes committed by young persons. And what was interesting was to see the contrast between individualistic cultures uh, which did not regard that behavior as, as, as serious uh, as the collectivist cultures. And that's, you know, that's an important issue to think about uh, in terms of how that plays out in the sanctions in the criminal justice system at large. So if there is such a difference in mostly uh, Asian and Eastern uh, collectivist cultures, um, you know, where the opprobrium that is attached to individual delinquency compared to what you find, uh, you know, in, in the more Western individualized cultures, you're likely to have a very different outcome in the way your juvenile system responds to those issues. You know, and, and I guess the, the last theme point uh, or take home message is uh, don't forget about those circumstantial environmental factors uh, in producing responses to behaviors, whether in the family, uh, the way the juvenile justice system responds to young people, um, uh, or the causes of crime. Okay, so I'm going to terminate there. Um, but is there uh, any burning comments that someone wants to add today before we close? We have a few seconds or half a minute or so. Okay, thank you all for your participation. Uh, your attention and turn, on, turn it over to others. I'm just taking your attendance also. It is my fault. How is she, Jill?
Vijay Lauki? Present ma'am. Rohit Vyapati? Present ma'am. Padani Kennedy? Present ma'am. Samitesh Singh? Yes ma'am. Swami Asthana? Yes ma'am. Shakun? Present ma'am. Shashank Mani Tripathi? Yes ma'am. Shubham Patsalya? Shubham Sanjish Sanchehdi? Present ma'am. Shubham Sharma? Present ma'am. Shri Chandana, Sujana Bain, 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 Sujana